I'll tell you, that, uh, that kids group is a tough act to follow each Sunday, I'll be honest with you. I think that's my favorite part of the morning is to see them up there interacting with one another. Joanne, thank you for that. That'll preach, by the way. In fact, do you want to come and... No? Okay. All right. We are grateful for those who, who took the time to, to decorate our, our worship space for Advent. It is uh, definitely beautiful in here, very festive. Uh, it, it does something to, to my spirit when I walk in and see these lights. Jesus is the light of the world, and every single light on these trees, every candle that is lit, uh, is, a, is a reminder of that for which I'm grateful. We begin a new series this morning, an Advent series. You may have noticed the graphic on the front of your bulletin is different. You may have noticed that the title on the inside flap on the left is different for the series. We're going to dive into the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke today, and we're going to be in chapter 1 for the next several weeks. We're going to look at at the faith of Mary. Now, if you had never seen the title of the series before, that word is pronounced magnificat, and it's Latin for what what Mary begins her her song of praise beginning in chapter 1, verse 47. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord. And so we're going to look at at what Mary, how she responded to the news that God was with her and would be using her in his unfolding plan of of redemption. So for today, we're going to begin in chapter 1, verse 26. We're going to look at some verses prior to that song of Mary. So if you have your Bibles, please turn, if you haven't already, to Luke chapter 1. And we'll read from verses 26 down through verse 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby, will be born, the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son. And is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. I've always been impressed with this passage about Mary and her interaction with the angel Gabriel. And I'm impressed with her response. Because in her response she showed that she was responding thoughtfully. We could, never, we could probably accuse Mary of a lot of things, but one thing we could not accuse her of is having a blind faith. Now, if you, if you don't know how to define blind faith, let's just define it like this. It is a belief without true understanding, perception, or discrimination. This is the kind of faith we often ascribe to people in the Bible. And you remember, we've talked about this attitude before. We talked about it back at Easter time. It's, it's this attitude that modern people today have that C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. It's this idea that as we look back to ancient people, we just assume that they were somehow dumber than we are. We're smarter than they are, right? I mean, we're 21st century people. We have iPhones in our pockets, and we have drones that can fly through the sky, and we have modern medicine, and we have all this technology and these, this stuff. Obviously, we are smarter than they are. And after all, they're all just a bunch of superstitious, hocus-pocus, believe-anything type of people. You know, modern people, we treat claims of the miraculous with skepticism. While those ancient people, they just immediately accepted everything without questioning. 
Now this, of course, we've, again, we've confronted this in the past, and we will continue to because it's amazing how that type of mentality seeps into our own way of looking at the world. This mentality is demonstrably false and exceedingly arrogant. We should not expect Mary to have just a blind faith. And in fact, as we look at the text, and as we've read it already this morning, we've seen that that's not, exa- that's not what she was dealing with at all from the beginning. All of Mary's rational faculties were fully engaged with this angel and what the angel was having to say to her. From the, from the greeting itself, back in verse 29, Luke tells us she was very perplexed at this statement. And she kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. As Mary is confronted with a, a messenger from God, her response is one that is thinking. She, she's pondering what she's, what she's hearing. She's reasoning it out. She's questioning what it means. She's, she's debating internally. What, is, what does all this mean? What are the implications for my life? How am I supposed to respond? And as the dialogue continued, she, she answered with her questions, and, and Gabriel responded to the questions, and then she's responding again. And as this dialogue ensues, her reasoning and her questioning continued. Hers was not some blind, immediate acceptance. But instead she asked the question, how can this be? She's perplexed at what the angel was saying. Virgins don't get pregnant. Except, well, one way. Mary was a teenager, yes, but surely she understood at least some level where babies come from. How can this be? And not only that, there's this whole issue with the, the child that the angel is talking about is going to be quite the individual. This is, this is no ordinary child. This child would be a colossal figure. Not only the greatest king in the history of Israel, but the greatest ruler the world has ever seen. Everything about the things that Gabriel is saying to this teenage girl, every single thing he's saying that is listened to and and honestly received at a rational level, is unbelievable. If we're being honest, and we set aside our, our snobbery for just a moment, we would come to the conclusion that the rational barriers that Mary faced in the first century are every bit as great as the ones you and I face today. And there's something about her response that is refreshingly real. Just like when you go through the Gospels and you you look at the the resurrection appearances of Jesus and you see the Gospels are very faithful to describe how Jesus was received by those who who should have known he was coming back. He told them he was going to rise from the dead. And yet when he did, the responses to him were real. They struggled to believe what their eyes were seeing. They struggled to comprehend. They struggled to recognize him. And there's something about that for me as as a rational, skeptical 21st century Western individual, there's something about that to me that is refreshingly real. There's something about this response to to extraordinary messages and events in Revelation. There's something about that that rings with an authenticity that I crave. And this is really the Bible's typical account of events. It's it's a real account of events. It's not some fantastical, unrealistic, glazed-over depiction of things. No, Mary was a real person, just like you and me, a real person who couldn't understand what all she was hearing, could not imagine it to be true, and just like you and I would do if we were put in the exact same situation, she's pondering, she's questioning, she's considering what it meant and what the ramifications were for her life. Now perhaps you, if you grew up in church, if you've been in church your whole life, if, if you see these kids and you watch them go next door and you, you know from your experience where they're going and what they're going to be learning and, and what that whole experience of growing up in church is like, perhaps at some point in your life you have felt pressured, especially in church, to be, well, what I would call unthinking, at least in this way, in your belief. You know, in many circles, skepticism and doubt, those are the greatest of virtues. Those are really the only absolute. 
And there's whole, there's whole branches of philosophy that are based on this whole idea that I, I can prove my own existence just by virtue of my ability to doubt. But in other circles, in religious circles, particularly conservative religious circles like our own, oftentimes any and all questioning is considered inherently bad. You don't question that. How dare you? How dare you have a doubt? How dare you not believe? How dare you struggle with what that could mean? And so in many circles, and God save us from being one of those circles, asking questions, even tough questions, is frowned down upon. And the expectation is to never question, to never wonder about what something means, to never be disturbed by the revelation that comes from God. Perhaps you, if you're like me, find Mary's what Tim Keller would call measured incredulity as a breath of fresh air. Because it underscores, as I've already said, the realness of what's happening in the text. I mean, if a young teenage virgin in first century Palestine was not troubled, if she was not disturbed, if she was not questioning what she's being told here, how could it be true? How could this story be true? If she is not troubled, how could we believe it? Everything in her life at this point is at stake. Her betrothal to Joseph is at stake. Her social status in her community is at stake. Her very life itself is at stake. And God, when he comes to her in this angel, he's not asking her to disengage her mind to become some sort of mindless drone. He's inviting her to respond to him with everything that makes her her. He's asking her to engage with his invitation with all of herself. It's an invitation to believe even the unbelievable. Mary had her doubts. Mary asked her tough questions, and yet, through it all, she remained open to obedience. And the beautiful thing for me as I, as I see this one who had this massive weight placed upon her shoulders in, in, in light of her openness to, to obedience in the midst of the pressures and the weight, what's beautiful is God, who is ever gracious and ever faithful, how he graciously provides what she needs to move towards faith. It's not, Mary, just be quiet and do what I say. You know, too often in my fallen parenthood, that's my, that's my way of dealing with my children's tough questions. I just want you to oh, do what I say. Just stop, just be quiet and do it. God, forgive me for that. I don't, I don't sense that in the heart of God at all. Especially here. It's not a shut up, Mary, and obey. It is, I, I, can, I can handle your questions. I appreciate your honesty. I embrace your sincerity. And I'm going to graciously provide you aids to your faith. And so... In this matter pertaining to her, virgin, her virginity, Gabriel says to her in verse 35, here's how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Most High, will overshadow you. Now that overshadowing language, that is not a sexual concept. That is something that speaks to God's creative power. If you want to get a, a sense from the Old Testament of some sort of parallel to what's happening here with the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, just turn to the, the second verse of the entire Bible. And there you have, in the act of divine creation, the Holy Spirit hovering over the dark and formless void of the earth. And so, as we look at Mary's cousin, as she is getting ready to have her baby, her miraculous baby, John, who, is, who will be John the Baptist, the Old Testament parallel for, for Zechariah and Elizabeth and John the Baptist would be Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. These two advanced in age individuals who didn't have children and yet were promised they would. And God did a supernatural work in their bodies so that Isaac could be born and God would fulfill his promises in that way. But the Old Testament parallel for Jesus is not, is not like that. But rather the miracle of creation. 
It's not God enabling an old couple to have a baby. This is the beginning of God's miraculous work of new creation. And it's not by a a, a sexual act. No, it is by the Holy Spirit's creative work. And what's amazing to me is that the same Spirit who's going to come upon Mary, the same power of the Most High who's going to overshadow her and by whom the Christ child would be conceived in her womb, he is the exact same Spirit who awakens and kindles faith. The Holy Spirit in this text, I believe, is not just conceiving a baby in Mary's womb, but he is conceiving faith in Mary's mind and in her heart. He is the one who works to convince us of those things that we otherwise could not wholeheartedly embrace. He is the one who awakens. He is the one who convicts. He is the one who affirms. He is the one who transforms. And it is only up to him to produce that in our lives. And it is only up to us to respond. You and I cannot muster up within ourselves faith. It's something that that God in his power cultivates deep inside of us. He enables us to respond to all that he says and does. And so, if you think this morning, as we read this text, as you think about Mary's response, this very real response, if you think that you are light years away from a faith like Mary's, I want you to take heart. Because you're closer than you think. Because the same God that was at work in her life then is the exact same God who is at work in your life today. The same God who who comes to us at Christmas and the same God who is coming to us again at the end of time is the same God who comes to us even now, moment by moment. And faith is enabled when the Spirit of God and the Word of God come together. And the miracle that's going to happen in Mary's body physically points to what can happen in our minds and in our hearts when God's word is proclaimed in the power of the Spirit. For faith, the Bible says, comes by hearing. So hear this. Gabriel's exhortation in verse 37 is as true for you and me this morning as it was true for Mary in the first century and as true as it was all the way back when it was said to Abraham and Sarah In Genesis chapter 18, let not your heart be troubled, for nothing is impossible with God. So you can give your doubts to God. You can ask God your tough questions. You can give him those things that seem to be holding you back from from living out of faith like, like Abraham and Sarah and Mary and others. He can handle it. God is big enough to handle your skepticism. And he's also big enough to provide all that you need to move beyond your doubt to a faith that can move mountains. God never ceases to amaze me. You know, I I joked back in uh, our last sermon series when I was in Revelation. I joked that um, J.D. Walt... The, the, the writer for the daily text from Asbury's Seedbed, um, I joked that he was listening to my sermons and he was copying my sermons on his daily text. His little devotional that he writes that arrives in my email. And I joked that because as I was working through Revelation, it felt like every time I preached a message, it was that, that week it was, it was already in my inbox. It's like, were you listening to my sermon prep time? And, and after the, the, the one I got this Friday, I'm starting to feel like it's kind of creepy. I really, I really do feel like he's, he's stalking me or doing something to, 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 to do. It's, it's almost like a prank or something. Because the one that he wrote on Friday was, was basically my sermon today. The title was, The Wisdom Behind a Good Old Fashioned Trust Fall. And in that devotion, he's talking about faith and doubt. And he says this. He says, typically, people think the opposite of faith is doubt. As if you have doubt on one end of the spectrum and faith on the other end of the spectrum. But in reality, doubt lives very close to faith. In fact, he says, doubt may be a necessary precondition for faith. And so he uses the trust fall as as a metaphor. Now, you all know what the trust fall is, right? I mean, please don't ask me to demonstrate this morning. Because that would require some of you coming up here and standing right here 
and I'd have to turn around and do the nest tea plunge into your arms. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I love you, but I don't know if I trust you. The trust fall. And what Walt says is this about the trust fall. He says, in the end, I'm not doubting if they will catch me. Now, I don't know who he's talking about, but there's always a little bit of doubt that you're going to get caught. So, But let's give him the benefit of the doubt here. I'm not really doubting if they will catch me. I'm doubting whether I have the courage to actually relinquish my control over myself. And why am I doubting this? It's because of my fear. Fear, not doubt, is the opposite of faith. After all, what is faith? What is trust without an element of doubt, without a degree of risk? It is because of the presence of risk and doubt that faith becomes so important. And so the problem in our lives and the problem in the lives of those who are very real in their response to God in Scripture, the problem is not their doubt. The problem is their fear. It is fear that leads to self-protection. When you look at the world around you today, what causes you to, to hoard things in your pantry? What causes you to go to the gun store and buy as many bullets as your shopping cart and your wallet can afford? It's fear. It is fear. It's the sense that I have to provide for myself. I have to protect myself. I need to stay in control of my life. And the only way I can do it is if I do this, 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 and this. It is fear that induces anxiety in our lives. It is fear that fans the flames of uncertainty about the future. It is fear that stifles our courage and stifles our conviction and inhibits our decisiveness. It is fear that is the opposite of faith. And faith as the opposite of fear is that movement away from self-preservation to self-abandonment. Faith is that movement from self-protection to entrusting my life into God's hands. Faith is that movement from my need to be in control to surrendering all of myself to the control of God. Now you find this spectrum present in Luke chapter 1. There's a really interesting comparison in here. I didn't read the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, but if we had gone a few verses prior to the story of Mary, we would have seen something very similar to what happened in Mary's life. There's a very interesting comparison between Mary and Zechariah in this chapter. Both of them were visited by the same angel. So Gabriel appears basically three times in the Bible, back in Daniel and then in Luke chapter 1. So Gabriel has appeared to both of them. He reveals to both of them that some incredible claims about something God is going to do miraculously in their lives. Gabriel, to both Mary and Zechariah, invites them into some grander plan of God. And both of them doubted. Both of them had questions. And yet, only one of their doubts was met with divine approval, and the other was met with divine disapproval. In verse 20, Gabriel says to Zechariah, Since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until your child is born. You see, in the Bible, not all doubt is created equal. Some doubt, as we've already seen with Mary, is a sign of an open mind. It's the, the, the tangible Evidence of, of an honest wrestling with concepts, an engagement of the whole person with an openness to considering what it could mean and what, what I, how I can, what, what's, what's, what's going to happen and what should I do and, and all those types of things. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open mind that asks realistic questions, seeking to understand the nature of a thing and what it could mean. But for others, the doubt is a sign of a closed mind. You see, for the closed mind, doubt becomes a defense. A defense against 
the possibility of something being true. I refuse to believe that it's true because I doubt. And this is the problem in our culture. This is the problem in the West. Because we all know, enlightened people, we need scientific proof. I need the hard facts. I need the evidence. But the truth is, the stubborn refusal to believe has very little to do with eyewitnesses or evidence or scientific proofs, and it has everything to do with our broken ability to trust. You see, doubt for us today is nothing more than a way to remain in control of our lives. I'm fearful, and so I doubt, and my doubt justifies my decisions to grasp and to cling and to scramble and to muster up control and provision for myself. I have to protect me. And how do I justify that? When, when God the Holy Spirit is constantly coming to convince me of my sin and constantly coming to convince me of the love of God and constantly inviting me into a meaningful life of joy and peace and hope, how do I protect myself from him? My doubt. And the big difference in Luke chapter 1 between Mary and Zechariah is this. Mary, we're told, confused, makes sense, disturbed, I should hope so. She pondered and she questioned just like you and I would. But in verse 12, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear. Overwhelmed with fear. Which is what led Gabriel to observe in verse 20. You don't believe. The opposite of faith is not doubt. I believe J.D. Walton is right. Doubt lives very close to faith. The opposite of faith is fear. Now it's true in verse 30. Gabriel does tell Mary not to fear. He says, do not be afraid. And, that, and perhaps you could read into that to say that, that there is at least the presence of temptation to be afraid. I, I, I hope there was. Because <laughs> that's a very real response. Imagine what she's facing. Now in our world today... Teenagers can get pregnant, and no one bats an eye about it. In fact, you're not allowed to even say anything about it. You'll get in trouble. But in those days, it was, it was a big deal. Huge. And if Mary wasn't at least tempted to fear for herself and for her, her, her baby, her, her, her fiancé, then I would question, well, her sanity. But the text would would suggest not that she gave in to her fear. The text would suggest that she obeyed the command not to fear. She obeyed, and she believed. And I like to think that's the challenge for you and me today as we start off our Advent season. As we set aside, I'm so grateful for Bonnie's, Bonnie's prayer and for Joanne's message, this reminder that the season is not about the presence, it's not about the food, and frankly, it's not even about your family. Now, those are all great things. And I love presence, and I love food, and I love my family. But those things mean nothing apart from Jesus. So as we dive into this season, and we begin to think about what the season is really about and what it really means, and yeah, some of you have celebrated 50, 60, 70, 80 of these seasons. You can experience it anew today. Because the challenge is always there to fear. The challenge is always there to want to resume control, maybe not of my whole life, but perhaps over this situation. You know, God's got big things to deal with. He doesn't, he doesn't care about this thing. Or, this is such an important thing, I can't afford to trust this with, some, with, with someone else. That temptation is always there, no matter how old you are, no matter how many Christmases you've had, no matter how many Advent sermons you've heard. 
So that's the challenge for you and me today. That's the example that should inform our lives and our our relationships with God, our relationships with one another, how we approach this entire season. Faith is that movement from fear and through the doubt into courage and all the way to an active trust in the promise of God's goodness. Faith is saying, I do not know what's best for my own life. (laughs) If you've lived for yourself and you've tried to make decisions for your life and you try to live apart from God, if you're honest with yourself, you'll know that it gets you ultimately nowhere. You and I don't know what's best for us. Faith says, I don't know what's best for my life. I can no longer place limits on what God is able to do. I must believe that the word of God that never fails will never fail my life. I must turn away from my fear. I have to let go of control of my life. I have to fall trustingly into those sure hands of God. Falling backward, Mary abandoned herself into the secure arms of one who was greater. And she didn't fall backwards blindly. She fell backwards with eyes wide open to the truth of who God is. You can have hope because God is faithful. Because God is true. Because God can be trusted. Doubt is not the failure to trust God. Doubt is an opportunity to move beyond trusting yourself all the way to obediently giving yourselves completely over to the care of God. God created you to think God created you to question. God created you to ponder. God created you even to doubt and to ask tough questions. But at the end of the day, he's inviting you and me to the trust fall of faith. To say yes. To say yes to him. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when we don't totally understand or know or can grasp the outcome. Even when we haven't been able to reason out what all the the ramifications could be. Because the the bottom line is, in a trust fall, yeah, I'm trusting they're going to catch me, but it may hurt a little when I land. Maybe some person person doesn't hold their end up and and my ankle gets banged on a a rock or or the altar or something. Something, Anything could happen, I don't know. And yet, I'm going to trust. And in the coming weeks, as we think, think about these things and look at, at the, 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 the faith of Mary, the trust fall of Mary, we'll see that what, what, what comes from that. What are the amazing fruits in the life of those who move through doubt to faith? And so I encourage you this Advent to say yes to him as the word of God and the spirit of God converge in your life. Say yes to Jesus. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that when we have questions or when we're uncertain about things, even when we, when, we, when we have doubts, that you don't look down upon us. You're not disgusted with us. You, you welcome us. You welcome us to come to you with our questions. You welcome us to grapple with your word and what your word might mean for our lives, you, you, you invite us to wrestle with that. And in the midst of all that, you graciously provide what we need if we're open to you. Holy Spirit, I pray now, even as, as we're wrapping up this service and getting ready to move into our final highest act of worship in the receiving of the, the, the Lord's Supper, Holy Spirit, be at work powerfully in our minds and in our hearts. Sharpen these minds that have grown dull. Awaken these hearts that have fallen asleep. Soften and tenderize what has become calcified and hard and resistant to you. Lord, do that work in awakening us and and, and enlivening us so that we can respond to you. And may this Christmas season, when it's all said and done and when our our stomachs are full and our, our bank accounts are empty, Lord, At the very end, 
may we have moved from fear to faith. With your help and with your power and with the presence of your word and your spirit actively converging in our lives, that we would be a people like Mary who said to you, may you have your way with me. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.